this here. All right, so as people come in, real estate investment, best strategies. Rich came up with this, so I can't take credit. <laughs> real estate investment, best strategies, ribs. So we're going mukbang over some ribs. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah. <clears throat> so hey, everybody on Will's channel, I appreciate y'all joining. Uh, Will and I are gonna chow down on some ribs, talk about some real estate. I gotta get we're also water. shooting at the same time. We're shooting from my channel. So my assistant, Sarah, is over on this side over here. And uh, so you might hear us talking to her. Testing one, two. Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We're high tech in here. Uh, so, do we have anybody on the live? You guys shot yourselves out. If you're on the live, what's good? All right, so we're getting ready to record a video for Rich's channel. So, you guys go subscribe to his channel. What's it telling the. Uh, it's Rich Shiro, S H E A R R O W. Talking all about real estate. <clears throat> so we're, yeah, we're, we're doing a little bit of food here. So we figured, I figured I'd just go live. So yeah, I'm a Cowboys fan. I figured I would go live uh, while we record Rich's video. So you guys just have the benefit of a sneak peek. But what I want you guys to do is support Rich and, and uh, jump over to his channel because he's dropping some videos with a wealth of knowledge. But uh, I also got a couple of requests for some real estate videos. So uh, here we go. You guys are going to enjoy a little bit of knowledge as we mukbang on some ribs. I got to get my potato ready, man. So Ridge does, Rich, I said Ridge. <laughs> Rich does the, um, what are those, homestyle potatoes? What yeah. They, is that what they call yeah, them? home fries. Home fries, like the diced up potatoes. And I do the uh, baked potato that I would promptly drench in butter and uh, a lot of pepper. In case people are wondering, I'm just getting everything set up for shooting my video. And we're going to edit this thing up and make it kind of cool. But when Will said let the live stream it, this is going to be funny for you to watch. <laughs> Y'all get the real live uncut. Yeah, you get the uncut version. <clears throat> oh, am I going too fast for your nope, version? No, nope, you're good. Mm -mm. Oh, are we, are we recording? Yeah, everything's set up. We're recording. Your voices are on. Okay, okay. So we can you can just edit yeah. it. You can kind of just. We've got camera one. Okay. She's going to follow with that camera. Sweet. Here's our main camera straight ahead. All right. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, I want to pick it. <laughs> So, so the whole idea of, of shooting this video, just for those on the live stream, <clears throat> the whole idea of this video is going to be to break down some real estate investment best strategies. We are going to uh, eat some ribs along the way. Uh, so you get it. Real estate investment best strategies. Ribs. Ribs. <laughs> so... Uh, couldn't think of any better person to start this series with than my really good friend, Will Moss. Will is also known on YouTube as Will Motivation. He's built an incredible channel. Thank you. Now that channel is actually the least impressive part about him. So he's gonna get <laughs> embarrassed now. Uh-oh. So Will is an entrepreneur. He started a website actually before Facebook, right? Correct. So it's a social network called uh, HBCU Connect. Yes, sir. 
So imagine LinkedIn meets Facebook, has a baby, and is that kind of yeah. a good description? Yeah, that's okay. good, yeah. So uh, on top of that, re Will is a real estate investor. Yeah, started my career real estate investing with Rich. Yeah, so we started, uh, what was it, 2011? Yes. So 2011, we started uh, buying properties for Will. Uh, nothing against Will's experience, but but over time he's learned more oh, yeah. and learned more and yeah, learned yeah. more. Asked a bunch of questions, and he's become extremely successful in real estate. Now, for for those wondering, real estate investment the the best time ever to invest in real estate was two thousand eleven. Yeah, I, I mean, the, <laughs> if I could go back in time, yeah. <laughs> what was it you said one time? The biggest mistake you made was not buying them all. Yeah, yeah. So. Will has built an incredible real estate portfolio. He's flipped houses. He just did a new build flip. Uh, we're gonna be talking about all kinds of strategies in this video. And we're gonna be talking about kind of his journey along the way. Maybe throw in a little bit of entrepreneurship in sure. here while we're at it. Sure. And eat some ribs along the way. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, I have to say thanks for the ribs. Hey, no but I also have to say thanks for the partnership over the years. Um, there some deals that I regret not doing that Rich suggested I did that I do. So that is the that speaks to the value of having a good real estate uh, agent or um, real estate uh, advisor. Advisor, there you go. Consultant, consultant, <laughs> all of the above. So I have to thank you for uh, all the partnership over the years, for the knowledge, making me feel right up front when we did our first four deals. Uh, right up front, I felt confident in, in your advice and abilities and uh, impressed by your willingness to say, let's go look at these properties, like without, <laughs> I had no iota of, that this agent is going to be lazy, you know, so I was impressed with that. It gave me confidence and it worked out. <laughs> so, so just to give everybody a little bit of history, uh, Will actually called me, it was on a Friday afternoon. Will calls me and he says, hey, let's, uh, let's look at this property that you have listed over here close to where he lives. And by the way, thanks for letting us <laughs> shoot at your house. Oh, of course. So Will calls me. It's a Friday afternoon. Where Will lives is probably in the worst traffic area in Columbus. Definitely on a Friday. And he calls me on a Friday and he says, hey, how about looking at this property? It was like, I don't know, 4 o'clock, something like that. <laughs> So I travel all the way out to, to, it's an area called Black Lake, Ohio, suburb of Columbus. We travel all the way out here and, and uh, again, nothing against Will, but on the phone, he's a real impressive gentleman in person, <laughs> but on the phone, he mumbles. So I get this fella calls me, he, he mumbles, I've had this property listed for six months, no one has even remotely That's crazy. been interested in it. That's crazy. And he calls me and he's like, hey, how about we look at this property? Now, what he doesn't know is it was date, date night. night. It was date night with my <laughs> wife. So I had to call my wife and, hey, I'm going to be late, all this. So we go out, we look at the property. Now, when I met Will in person, I, my fears were, were cured <laughs> because uh, he's a very impressive gentleman in person. Thank uh, you. I didn't realize that. He pulls in in a car that's probably worth more than my house is. <laughs> At that time, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, we go look at the property. He makes a decision in probably 15 minutes that that is what he wants to buy. And Thanks to your explaining the process. Yeah. And he, he says, hey, you know anything else? I want to buy, you know, maybe three or four properties. I'm like, okay, cool. So, uh, we, uh, we get, just so happened, I had just shown a particular couple, 130 properties on the east side of Columbus. One couple. One couple, 130 properties. That's crazy. Now, that was back in the days when there were 130 properties for sale. Now, we're lucky to find two, yeah, you know. For sure. But... We come down to, to uh, this time, he says, hey, you want to look at these properties? 
I had already shown every single foreclosure property on the east side of Columbus to this couple. I knew them all. So pure luck. Pure luck. For me. Yeah. Pure luck for me. We took off from there. I showed Will five properties. He ended up buying four that weekend, all in cash. Should have bought five. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we developed this partnership. And over the years, what, 80, 80 some deals? Probably. 80 or 90 Getting deals? up there. Yeah, getting yeah. up there. You count the, the buy and the sell side. Yep. So to all the aspiring real estate agents out there, this is a prime example. Just because someone calls you on the phone and mumbles. Okay. <laughs> I hate the phone, that's why. Don't judge. Go out, show them properties. So not only are you going to learn a little bit from a uh, real estate uh, agent or, you know, that perspective, but also from an investor perspective, because my side of that story was I have been shopping uh, real estate agents for a little bit, uh, showing me properties, and I was trying to get a feel for how they work. And... Rich happened to be, the way I shop the uh, real estate agents is I, uh, I would find the house that I liked and then I would just go with whoever the, li the listing agent was to show me the house. And I would try to be a little bit difficult actually on purpose because I wanted to see what kind of work ethic they had to see if it would align with, with mine. And, I, and one thing I figured is at some point it's going to be important to... Um, it's going to be important to if the if the market gets hot that you have a real estate agent that uh, has a work ethic, you know, and, and, and is willing to show your property uh, before as an advantage before other people get to see it, right? So, so, uh, so I met with Rich that Friday. Like he said, story goes just like that. But my what was going on through my head was let me ask him some questions and let's let me get a feel for how he will work with me. And the questions that I had, because there were some things I didn't know. Like, for example, the house that we, that first house we were looking at was a HUD home. Everybody has sort of a bad image of HUD before they actually buy something from HUD. And, and I didn't know anything about it, but I know it kind of had a sort of bad reputation. Just HUD home just has this yeah, scary kind of ring to it yeah. or whatever. So, um, so I asked some questions about the HUD home and Rich to me was an expert and he made it seem super, super simple. So I was like, okay, I'm going with this guy, right? This guy is gonna be my guy and we're gonna, let's give it a shot. And so we, and so he, told, he explained the process, he made it seem real simple. And that night, I believe, it was Friday, but we had bids in Monday, right? Yeah, we had bids in for Monday. Everything was on point. Um, you got all four bids. We got, I, got, I couldn't believe it, cause we kind of lowballed a little bit, uh, relatively, I think. But Rich guided me through that too. He said, you know, he gave me exactly what I wanted to hear as far as being on my side. He wasn't, he wasn't shying away from me getting my feet wet to say, well, let me be conservative and let me a bit a little bit lower. He was just with me on it. He just said, okay, let's, we can do that. It doesn't hurt. Let's just, if that's how you want to do it, let's go for it. So I got confidence based on Rich's confidence and based on the trust factor we were building. And like you said, we got all four properties. And one of those properties of those first four, let's see, do I still have all four of them? Um, no, I sold Piney Creek, um, but I have, I, I yeah. sold Piney Creek and I sold uh, the other one, uh, 235, Brugal, Brugal yeah. yeah. So we're going to sell one of the, the most expensive of those first four uh, was Ashenden, uh, which is a four bedroom. It was 90,000. And now we're, we're, I just went in it yesterday. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. I got to trash it out and everything, but, but we're going to sell that one. And then we'll look for some more investments. Right. Now, for what it's worth, when, when, when we went out, just for the real estate agents out there, they're like, wait a minute, you listed the property and you're telling him strategies, et cetera. HUD makes it very clear for a listing agent that lists HUD properties that you do not represent the federal government. <clears throat> you represent the buyers on them, just we have the ability to list them on the MLS. So we're not, we do have certain duties to them. There's certain responsibilities, but, but we can give advice to people. You know, every real estate agent that's watching this is, is like, hey, wait a minute, you're working against your seller. No, no, HUD represents themselves. And, then, and they approve the deals, right? Yeah, they approve the deals. I have no control over any of that. 
And so I was able to give Will some advice that maybe I couldn't always give on a, on a listing that I have. Mm -hmm. So his initial thought of calling the listing agent, while that's a common thought, that would be the worst advice I could give someone. <laughs> but always get your own agent that works in your best interest. You know, everybody says real estate agents talk out of both sides of their mouth. Well, it depends on who we're representing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and how it works. So just out of curiosity, Will, um, what made you decide to start buying up properties in, in 2011? As we sit great here. question, right? As we sit here and kill ribs. <laughs> let's not forget to talk about this great food. So what are you, what are you eating on? I'm eating on ribs. Uh, th these are from the Hickory House here in, in Reynoldsburg. Awesome ribs. Probably my favorite ribs anywhere in the country. Yeah, Hickory House. Ribs fall off the bone. As you guys can see a little bit here, I removed my bone so I can just deal with the meat with my pork. <laughs> uh, I got a baked potato, coleslaw, ribs. So shout out to Rick, uh, Hickory House. But to answer your question, what made me start buying in 2011 when everybody was... Everybody's scared, right? Yeah. I, I thought to myself, I had a condo that I wanted to sell. And the problem was I was going to lose 40 grand on that condo, maybe 50 grand on that condo mm -hmm. in a matter of two years. But I bought it for 140,000. They're saying, if you sell, it's going to be worth 90,000 or less. I couldn't believe it. So I said, you know what? This is, this is artificial. Because even though the economy has slowed down, people in Columbus, Ohio are still working. Yeah. So they still need a place to stay. So this is just because they're afraid to buy because all the hype of everything slowing down. The banks are not lending as much money, all that kind of stuff, right? So I said, okay, the way I'm going to make, like, make it even or whatever is, is um, I'm going to, instead of sell my condo for a loss, I'm going to rent my condo out and look for whoever else wants to sell for a loss. And then I'll try to pick theirs up and that's how I make up my difference. Like if I'm, if I'm losing, let me get one that's cheap and I'll ride it out. Okay. So that's when I started looking and I had a little bit of money to invest for kind of like the first time after being in business for about 10, 11 years, 12 years actually. So I had a little bit of money, money to invest. I didn't want to put it in the stock market because I had a bad, experience, a bad experience many years ago. So let me try real estate. And I always had this kind of slight, slight dream of owning property, just like it would be a nice type of thing. And my dad used to always say like, you know, own a piece of land, own some stuff and, and kind of just leave it at that. So, uh, so that was it. I was like, look, let me, let me. And then I had, I wasn't as afraid of being a landlord anymore because I had my own business and I understood working with clients. So I was like, a oh, tenant is just a client and it's just business. Mm -hmm. So you try to manage your business to be profitable and don't be scared of it. And this is uh, investment strategy number one. If you're in a position on real estate and you don't have to sell, it doesn't matter what the market does. As long as you don't sell it when the market's down, then you're okay. You know, everybody talks about when's the market going to turn or right. when's it going to do this or what do you think it's going to be next year i could flip a coin and be just as accurate in what my predictions are but the one thing i do know is over time it levels out now columbus is actually really boring when it comes to <laughs> real estate market trends yeah. and riding a wave but boring is good mm -hmm. because it's predictable <laughs> and then we end up being one of the top markets for a couple of years. Oh, we're number one market uh, in the entire United States for the past two years for market appreciation, market affordability, all of the factors that go into it. We've been the number one market for the past two years here in Columbus, Ohio. See it? There you go. So, but the reason it's so good of a market is because it's so predictable. Right. Yeah. And uh, so that's real estate strategy number one. Don't be in a position where you have to sell. If you're buying a property to flip, you want to be in a position that you can rent it. Right. That was always my thing. I don't know if you remember, but I wanted <laughs> yeah. to buy a property where I could flip it or rent it. Yeah. 
I mean, if it makes sense to flip the property so that you can build up cash to buy some more, then absolutely go flip. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if your fallback position is go bankrupt, that's a bad position. Right. <laughs> you know, you want to be in a position where you can withstand anything the market does. I mean, we, we just lived through it, COVID. I mean, everybody thought the real estate market was going to crash during COVID. Of course, it just boom, went crazy uh, during the COVID time. And we're still on the tail end of that. We're, we're seeing results all over the place uh, or increases. But the results this time might be different than the last time. So anyway, real estate investment strategy or best strategies. Can I, can I, can I go into uh, strategy number two? Yeah. At least this is my thought on it. Similar to stock market, I guess. But in real estate is way more... I think you have more time in the real estate market versus the stock market and it's more predictable and it's safer in my opinion. But strategy number two for me was relative to where I started. And when I say started, I'm not talking about started investing. I st I'm talking about relative to when I bought my first house, mm -hmm. bought my first house in the year 2000 for $160,000. So relative to my starting point, <clears throat> real estate market has gone down from there for since then, and then it has gone up since then. So my strategy was let me, relative to my knowledge and, and, and starting point, invest when the market is obviously low. Mm -hmm. Invest, buy, and hold. So when I say invest, I mean buy and hold. Buy and hold real estate when the market is low, and maybe people, maybe uh, the banks don't want to lend as much money. Maybe uh, the interest rates are higher and it slows down the, the buying and the, and the market slows down. And then there becomes more and more inventory. And then you have an opportunity to buy something at a lower price and then hold it and then rent it out, have rental properties. And then when the, when the market turns into a frenzy, a feeding frenzy, then there's an opportunity for me to flip. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, for me, I felt like it was obvious because of how much money that I would make. I'm not going to sell my entire portfolio, but buy low, hold, sell high if you want to flip and do that kind of thing. Now the, that ties into the portfolio adjustment. So this ties on to what Will is talking about when he's talking about selling his property that we're getting ready to list. So he's held that property for a long time. It's produced good cash flow. Four bedroom property, rents, I'm sure covered covered uh, expenses oh, yeah. and, and everything. Oh yeah. So that particular property he held on to, however, both for a brand purpose and for just the types of properties that Will wants to hold for the next 30 years, it doesn't fit into that category, right? So. Sometimes you buy a property and your intent is to flip it. Sometimes you buy a property and your intent is to hold it for five years. Sometimes you buy a property, in this case, it's 10 years, okay? Mm -hmm. And in other cases, you want to hold that property until the day you die. You want to pass it on to your kids mm -hmm. because it's that good of a cash flow property. So by understanding each one of those uh, uh, types of strategies, you can basically build an arsenal, right? Or, or as I call it, a tool belt. So a tool belt, everybody knows it holds all the tools, all that kind of thing. So I could build this house with a carpenter's ax. It wouldn't be a very nice house, <laughs> okay? And it would take me years to build it. Mm -hmm. But I could, you know, it's possible. Mm -hmm. But if you have the power saws, if you have the nailers, if you have the drywall tools, if you have all those things, number one, you're going to build a nicer house. Number two, you are going to uh, have the ability to shift when the market shifts or shift when an opportunity presents itself Right. and it's a good flip. Great. I can do that. When property is a good hold. Great, I can do that. 
when a property is that home run, you know, that one you're going to keep for 30 years, great, I can do that too. Sometimes you're going to do it with cash. It's great to have cash. But part of the strategies we'll get into a little bit later is how to leverage that cash to be able to purchase more and when that makes sense. I had so, to learn that. So the, the, the key part of, uh, of real estate is, number one, continuing to build your tool belt. Build that knowledge up. Work with a team of people that understand it. And be flexible. Don't be so rigid. You know, there used to be an old, old thing where someone would hold a, uh, hold a fork and they'd hold it really tight. And even the smallest human being can rip it right out of your hands. <laughs> but if you hold that sucker loose, no one will ever get it out of your hand. You know? So you can't set that rigid strategy that makes people uh, really make mistakes because they're so set on the path they're going to travel. I mean, for example, when Will was building, uh, he built a house, improved it, and flipped it. Now, some people would say that that was risky. But here's the thing. Will knew the market. He knew, knew the area he was building in. He knows how to get things done efficiently, quickly, and everything else. And he understood where the market was going. And then... And I had a trustworthy agent. Yeah. And then COVID hits. And I remember that phone call. Will calls me up. He's like, man, what are we going to do? Well, there was already enough margin in that house that even if you broke even, you know, you'd be okay. Yeah. But why lose your deposit money when you can at least break even? Right. Right. But what ended up happening was his construction got delayed. The market went up, which allowed more time to grow the, the value of the property. Yep. You went in and had the advantage of seeing what everybody else around had already done, and you were able to maximize all those things, and you were able to make a nice little profit on that property. Correct. Where other people would have panicked and said, you know what, let's just lose the deposit. Everyone that I know personally that has lost money on real estate has... Um, I wouldn't say panic, but but maybe we're looking at the short-term environment and situation and not the long-term. And at the time that I was seeing that those kind of things happen, I didn't have that much experience to be able to guide and coach. I kind of feel bad about it. But I have seen that, and, and, and usually <clears throat> that's what happens. People feel like, it's better to get out of a property and take a loss than to hold it for the long run and, and then win. Or because this, my thing with real estate, and this maybe is because I read a lot of books, um, and I'm not even a reader, uh, but I, when it got to real estate, I, I studied. And there's so many different things you can do creatively when you own property other than sell it, you know, when you, when you don't want to stay there. It's like first thing you can do if you don't, if you don't want to sell it, is you can rent it out. That's the most logical thing. Now, there's some situations where it's harder to rent a property out or maybe you even can't. Like if you live in a community where the HOA guidelines say you can't rent it out, which is something you should be careful of if you ever buy a house. Yeah, and don't buy a property in a place where you Yeah, because that, that means they're handcuffing you to take a loss in a potentially in a certain situation where you can't live there. Let's say your job moves you and you bought a house in a community that doesn't allow you to rent it, then they're handcuffing you to say, you gotta sell your house to a homeowner. So be careful of that if you buy a house, but um, but yeah, to your point, you know, people. So a lot of times people panic and they sell their house prematurely and they take a loss. Whereas if they just held, rented it out, fixed it up nice enough to rent it for a profit so that you're not losing money every month, but you rent it out, even if you have to break even, you rent it out, and ride the market uh, until it comes back up. And when it comes back up, then uh, then if you need to sell, you go ahead and sell it. Or you might get some equity in it, can pull the equity out and do whatever you have to do. You can buy another property, can reinvest somewhere else, 
you know, whatever you need to do. So let's talk about it. This is specific to Will, and this is something Will taught me. Because I would have never advised him to do this. <laughs> <clears throat> okay? He said he would never advise me to do that. No, <laughs> never in a million years. <laughs> this is interesting. So when Will bought his properties, he was buying distressed properties. Properties that, it, you know, they were kind of long in the tooth, right? <laughs> yeah, some tore up. Yeah, some pretty tore up. So he was renovating them. Now, normally, when an investor purchases a property, he renovates the property to the minimum standards it's going to take to get the rental income that he needs in order to, right. to, to move forward. Right. But you found out something that was really unique and, and I learned from, and that was that you created the best properties right. in the class. Right. So, so you had a single family home in a reasonable community, neighborhood, kind of suburbia type right. Middle situation. Class, yeah. You were putting granite countertops <laughs> yeah. in, stainless appliances, yeah. putting in real good hardwood floors. Well, then LVT came along and yeah. you started using that. Yeah. But was putting in really nice stuff. And gasp, you were putting garbage disposals back in and dishwashers, yeah. Yeah. which a lot of landlords, I mean, this is hindsight, this is crummy advice to not put a dishwasher and not put a garbage disposal in. But there's a lot of landlords that don't. Right, they don't want to maintain that. They don't want to maintain it. Those things break. Yeah. They don't want to deal with it. But here was the unique thing that I saw happen with Will's properties. Will created the best properties in its class. Now, right. I'm not saying you went and put crown molding yeah. and all the no. fancy stuff in houses that no, didn't no. deserve that. No, just check boxes. But he created the best rental properties in that income category. Exactly. Well, what ended up happening was Will had a waiting list. Yeah. If someone moved out, he had a waiting list for people to move in. Well, one of the biggest expenses when you're dealing with with uh, rental property right. is if it sits vacant. Right. You went through some rough rental periods. Never had market wise. Yeah, I never had a problem renting rent place. But you always had properties that were full. Yeah, but you know part of the reason why I wanted to do it like that? So part of the reason why I wanted to create the nicest rental property in a neighborhood was because one, the reason you just stated, I wanted to make sure that I would be the number one choice amongst the rental community, which would give me the fastest turnaround time to get it rented. And it also would potentially give me the highest rental price even though I didn't always charge the highest price, I charged what I thought was fair for the market for the person, the type of renter I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do that. But the other reason why I did that, I was trying to, I was trying to be um, cognizant of if, what happens if I have to sell this house for whatever reason, I wanted to be ready with granted. Get out quick. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's what part of the reason why I was doing that. I, I was, Okay, let me go ahead and put this stuff in there that's not going to make, like, doesn't, like, granite. It's pretty much not going to change. Usually the appliances are not going to get that messed up. So I already got my stainless steel in there. I already have my granite in there. All I got to do is carpet and paint, probably, you know. And usually that's all it is. So my thought was, let me be, let me get this done now while I have the money. Because <laughs> if, I, if I have to sell it, that means I'm probably tight on money. So let me get it done, and then I'll be ready in case. Right. So I always wanted to be ready to to flip a property if I had to, or buy and hold, um, you know, for the long run and have the best tenants. And that's pretty much what worked out. Because I remember a couple times we sold, like uh, I don't know if you remember Revolution, yeah, Revolutionary Drive. So we bought a little, um, like a little house, two bedroom house, and I fixed it up and I got ready to rent it out. But then I got this huge tax bill because I was using all of my money to buy assets. Right. And so I had to pay taxes on, on when you buy asset, you still got to pay tax. Yeah, so tax man doesn't stop just because the yeah. market's down. If it was an expense, <laughs> like to, I, normally I, was, I wasn't paying taxes on money I spent because they were business expenses. But when you buy an asset like a house, then that's an asset. You got to pay taxes. It's not, it's not a write-off, right? There are write-offs associated with the property, but, but anyway. But your real estate taxes still come due. Yeah, you? they can still come due, right? So... So we had a revolutionary drive. I had it ready to rent. It was in a neighborhood that was a little bit below the... Your standard property. Yeah, not, not my price point, but like 
I wanted to be right in the middle of the middle class or at the going towards the top of the middle class and as far as neighborhoods. And this one was a little on the lower side, at the bottom, probably bottom of the middle class, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I said, okay, this is a this is a potential property I can flip. And so I fixed it up, but I had it ready to rent. But because I fixed it up with the granite, the appliances, the kitchen was all nice. Then we turned around in a, sort of a dry market. We sold that property. Oh, it was ten days. It yeah, was gone. yeah, it was gone. Yeah, we sold that property quick. As a matter of fact, all the properties that we've sold here, no matter when the time period was, never uh, stayed on the market more than a month. Yeah. None of them. It's good to have a great realtor. I got a great realtor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to say I'm that good, but, but seriously, I, I joke all the time that I've never sold a house. People make decisions to buy houses, and I help people do that. But I, selling a house? Yeah. Yeah, people are either going to buy it or they're not. Right. Yeah. And and Will creates a great product, which makes it easy to 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 get in contract, easy to get close. Now let's talk about that nice high end of the of the market. You kind of reap the rewards of that when COVID hit, right? With the um, project uh, well, TRX. <laughs> well, that and and also you reap the rewards. You didn't have a lot of tenants that didn't pay. Right. For COVID, no, I didn't have, um, did I have, I may have slow play here and there, but nobody said, sorry, I can't pay rent. But these were people who respected you enough because you were providing a good project. You know, I'm not going to uh, speak for, for Will's tenants, but I'll bet that if I went out and interviewed Will's tenants, they'd be like, he's a good landlord, he fixes stuff, he takes oh, care yeah. of stuff. Yeah. He gives me a good property at a good value. So they're gonna do everything they can to make sure you get paid. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. I have some rules that are not standard landlord rules that err on the side of the tenant if the tenant is a good tenant. So for example, if I have a tenant that always pays on time, doesn't tear up my property, just a good tenant, then I just don't raise their rent. Mm -hmm. I just don't raise their rent because it's not it's worth more to me that I have a good tenant than to make an extra thousand dollars a year. Right. So, so I just, so they probably would say good things, you know, and I, of course I'm going to fix everything because I don't want my property to deteriorate. Well, and here's another one of those best strategies, you know, even if you have a property that's a low income property, keep it up. Yeah. You know, for sure. Turning over that property over and over again. What's your average tenant stay for? Average tenant, probably two years. So two years. Yeah. I've seen landlords where the where the average turnover was three months. Yeah. Could you imagine? Yeah, no, I definitely not. It, it might even be longer than two years, but it's I mean, rare to get somebody to stay one year. I'll put it that way. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't make money when it's less than a year if you're in the long term. Right, because yeah. you're going to lose that one month of downtime, and that's... No, I mean, the Airbnb yeah. game, obviously, you're turning it over all the time, but it's a higher price right but unless you're turning it a year you know it's tough to make money because you're you know there's downtime in there you know and you budget for that and then all of a sudden you've got a property that's vacant three months out of the year because you lost tenants that fast that's on the landlord that's not on the tenant plus you're not choosing good tenants you know you're not screening tenants which That'll lead me to the next part of this. <laughs> you get your pick of tenants. Yeah. Yeah. Because you put up a property. It's the <laughs> Sometimes nicest, I get too many applications. It's the nicest property in class. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you can be a little bit more discriminatory. Not discriminatory. That's a bad word. <laughs> right? Edit that out. <laughs> yeah. We, we can... We can be more uh, uh, picky, picky and choosy, yeah. about the their, best. their rental history. Yeah. You can call the former landlord yeah. and they're going to say, they were awesome. I was yeah. sad to see them go. Yeah. Their credit score is a little bit better. You know, their, their job history is a little bit better because you can pick and choose. Right. You're not putting it up on Craigslist, yeah. taking the first thing. Yeah. Coming. Sometimes we get, I have one property in that same neighborhood that we were talking about where uh, it's on that lower end of the middle class. Uh, and I only say lower end, I don't mean that like 
the lower class people, I mean, income and all that kind of stuff. No, for prices. Yeah, price point. So um, in that same neighborhood, I had probably the best property on the street, at least, and probably maybe in the neighborhood. And uh, But it's a popular neighborhood because there's a lot of good hourly paying jobs there that probably pay, you know, close to $20 an hour or somewhere in that 18 to $20 an hour where you can live off of it. So um, that property got the most, when I put it up for rent, it was a three bedroom house. I ended up selling that one, but it was a three bedroom house. And man, I got so many uh, applicants for it just off of not even a walkthrough. This is during COVID too. Uh, but it was just um, pictures and video that they saw of the property and had, man, more applications than I could even look at. Yeah. So that's one benefit, you know, maintaining the property, having the property nice, um, maintaining the reputation. Now, I have had, I don't know if this is like a real estate investment best practice or best strategy, but I have had, the only time I've actually had complaints, it wasn't from a tenant. I have one complaint at one particular house that we're getting ready to sell where I got duped right before COVID. And when I say I got duped, the person that signed the contract to rent the place was an older gentleman. He was a father, had some older kids that had their own kids. He signed the contract for them probably because they couldn't. And then when everything was all set to go, the young ones moved in. The, the young, young ones, ones moved in, and they and were. There was a reason they couldn't sign the right. They couldn't have passed your worst your tenants team. I've ever had. But um, but what happened is, I got the neighbors were so upset because these tenants were in there, and they were like the worst tenants you could probably think of. Everything you can name probably happened. But they started making complaints. They started calling the HOA, and it was to the point where they started going on to my Google reviews. Not as my tenants or somebody I've done business with, but as neighbors saying, oh, you know, he's a bad landlord, this, that, and the other. But in the meantime, they didn't realize that because COVID hit. You couldn't evict them. I couldn't evict them. Yeah. I couldn't evict moratorium. Yeah. I couldn't evict them. Um, and I just roll with the punches, though. You know, it's business. Like, to a certain extent, like, I've actually been where I grew up. I was on the other end of that. I was on a street where... There were a lot of rental properties and one particular rental property across the street from me had these crackhead uh, people like that would live there and they would come out in the streets and fight and cuss and do all type of crazy stuff in the middle of the night. And we would all be fed up with it, like, you know, and complain to the landlord and stuff like that. Now, he probably could have kicked them out because he always was getting tenants like that. But I sympathized with the people that wrote those bad reviews and I just had to roll with the punches and get the tenants out as soon as possible. And I'm still going to be penalized because they tore my house up. Yeah. Um, so that goes back to, so if you want a best strategy from that, a ribs, if you want your ribs from that, if you want your ribs from that, this is how you get your ribs is you screen the heck out of the tenants to the point that at least, you know, who's going to move in your house and you don't leave that up. Sometimes you can't leave it up to your own team and staff. Yeah. So I have and, like a team and staff. And anybody who lives in that house set a steadfast rule. Anybody who lives in that house is on the lease or notified to the landlord. Now, people are like, wait a minute, people have a little baby. Why do they need to be named on a lease? That's because if all of a sudden, uh, you know, four other people move in as roommates and now all of a sudden you've got a fire hazard. Right. Right. Not just, you know, potentially, you know, like you said, get duped on who's going to be living there. But set up, I always recommend, and this is the best strategy for you. Ribs. The ribs. I always recommend that the landlord themselves go out and change the furnace filter in that property. So you can, yeah. Every three, four, yeah. six months max. Okay. Yeah. So that you can see, number one. You need to change furnace filters every three to six months. Number two, you can see how people are taking care of your property. Or not. <laughs> or not. And most importantly, is you know who's living in that property. Right. I have landlords all over the place 
that will tell you that it's not their tenant that's the problem. It's the boyfriend that she right. broke up with. Yeah. And then comes by and happen. throws rocks and, and breaks, breaks the, wood, the door down. Yeah. I've had that call in the middle of the night from one of my tenants. Uh, and it wasn't your tenant, right? That broke the door, no. Yeah. It was her boyfriend. Yeah. I got a call in the middle of the night. She said somebody tried to break in her house. But when I went over to her house to check the situation out, she was calm. Like, she knew what was going on and everything. I was like, okay, I know what this was. They, it was a boyfriend came over, had an argument or something. She slammed the door in his face and kicked it in. And don't ask me and how. it I, does work in reverse, too. So we're not talking just boyfriend, girlfriend. It works reverse where the girlfriend is, right. is the one throwing rocks through the windows. <laughs> you know? Sarah's raising her hand. Our, our camera person is right over behind the scenes here. She's bricks, raising her hand. Rocks and bricks. Yep. Ribs. So broken. So Will, moving forward. Okay. Will hasn't even taken advantage. One of the best strategies out there is where you buy a property, renovate it, rent it, refinance it, and then go and, and repeat. Now yep. Will's been more focused on pay down debt, pay down debt, yeah. pay down debt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have. Instead of rather than expand as much as I could. Right. But if I could have done it over again, going back to 2011, at, when, when we first got started, I felt like I didn't have any corporate challengers. I didn't have any big competitors. Right. But within probably two years, the big guys came in, and then I had probably two or three big investment companies competing, uh, like American Homes for in those guys. Yeah. So, but before that, when I had... When we well, first looked. Well, it used to be just America's Homes. Now, right now, there's 12 I could name off the top of my head that would all be competing with for the same property that yeah. you're going after. Yeah. So, now, so if I could go back in time, leveraging my money. Uh, but see, I had to learn some things, though. I had to learn about relationships with banks. I had to learn um, how to leverage that money and why it made sense and doing the math against it. So, but it, but yeah, going back and looking at, so now if this opportunity ever happens again, that's, that's why people say, well, what happens if you invest in real estate? And it, like a lot of times people want to invest when the market is hot. They're like, let me buy a house now. Now it's time to buy a house, right? But then a lot of people are like, well, what happens if I buy a house and then I invest and then the market drops? Mm -hmm. Like that's why the reason why they don't want to be an investor. But my thing is if the market drops and you're an investor, then that's your, everything went on sale. Yeah. You know what I mean? So everything goes on sale. You buy it, you hold it, you let it go up. And if it keeps dropping, you keep buying. If it bottoms out, that's the best time. Then it starts going back up, you keep buying. And then eventually it gets to a point where you have to make some decisions. Like, do I keep buying right now or do I start flipping with Rich? Now, here's the, here's the real estate uh, consultant's view. A good deal is a good deal whether the market's hot or whether the market's crummy. A good deal is a good deal. Right. Now, that may the strategy for that deal may change. So for example, the the property that that you did the flip on. Recently. The, the new build. T R X, okay. Project T Rex. Yeah. So you could have rented that property for more than the <laughs> debt service. I think so, yes. Okay. Yes. So if the market would have taken a tank from from the COVID uh, experience if the market would have taken a tank mm -hmm. you could have held on to that property yeah. and, and in fact it would have been long-term capital gains if you held on to right it, where right. where you paid regular income tax that's this is a good learning moment because i'm gonna i don't remember how long do you have to hold a property for it to be long term one year that's it yeah and the difference between long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains is what uh 15 well in your tax bracket Let's use average tax bracket. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Average tax bracket, 15% versus your normal income tax rate. Mm -hmm. So let's say your normal income tax rate is 28%, which I know that you're in the, oh, hurt me category. <laughs> Good for you. Right. Nice problems to have when yeah. you have to pay too much in taxes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But average tax rate is 28%. Uh-huh. 28% versus 15 15 for short term or long term? For long term. So long-term capital gains on average for someone who makes average 
would be 15%. What about short terms? Short term capital. Short term is going to depend on their income. Mm -hmm. But but here's the catch. Mm -hmm. So let's say you flip a house and mm -hmm. let's say you hit a home run. Yeah. 100 grand. Yeah. And let's say that you make 60 grand, 70 grand a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> that 100 grand is going to raise the tax rate on your 70 grand. Okay. Yeah. So everything goes up. Yeah. So it's not just the 28%, but it's increasing the overall income. Mm -hmm. it, it's treated like regular income. Okay, okay. So you know? get taxed on like regular income. So all of a sudden, you used to be in the, you know, 16, 17%. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, you're in the 25, 28% yeah. tax bracket yeah. because you flipped a house. Yeah. So all of these things take, take <laughs> into account. Now, now again, these are nice problems to have. <laughs> If you have to pay too much money in taxes or what you think is too much money in taxes, you're doing it right. Yeah. You know, now there's some other strategies for more long-term stuff. You, you can do 1031 exchange. Right. You can, I mean, there's the best investment out there right now, period, the end for capital gains is, they're called opportunity funds. Mm -hmm. Incredible opportunities there. But... For general purposes, let's just take all and put all that aside, all that tax strategy stuff, which... I got a, I got a recommendation for you. Yeah. 10-minute videos on those opportunity funds. A 10-minute video on opportunity funds. Run it on your channel. Go. I'll run it on my channel as well. We have a we have a request. I actually teach a continuing ed class. That's a good one. On <clears throat> opportunities. That's funds. a good one. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Like, you could title it almost something like that. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. So, the... The uh, but let's set all that aside. Just holding a property for that period of time. Now, let's give a strategy that you haven't used, but let me get your opinion on it. Okay. So, so I know right now watching is going to be people that are like, I don't have the money for for an investment property right. down payment. <clears throat> I can barely get my own house. Right. Right. Yep. Okay. So. Let's say that someone purchases their own property. Number one, you can put less money down on it. You can do an FHA loan, you can do lower down payment conventional loans. There's all kinds of programs for buying your own house. Uh, not necessarily government sponsored or free money, just the way you finance it, mm -hmm. right? So okay, you buy a house and you put a little bit of money in it to make it worth a little bit more, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Then you pull out a line of credit on it to make it worth more money. <clears throat> now you've got the down payment to go buy a house. Okay, you've got a line of credit to pull on. Yep. But instead of selling this house, you rent it. Right. So when you bought that house, you thought forward enough yep. to say, you know what, I'm going to buy a house that if I need to, I could rent it. Yep. But if I can sell it, I can sell it. Right. Right? Right. So now all of a sudden, person goes and they're like you know what you've created income I want to buy another house but why don't I hold on to this one? right now this is a strategy that that is an interim strategy someone buys the house they live in it for two years yep then in the meantime they build a new house like you built yep. the one that you flipped yep where you're building it at a minimum level, yep. but you're going to improve it. Yep. Right now, it's going to take a year to build that house. Yep. Market goes up in a year. Plus, you get to see what everybody else does. Right. You keep your original house, rent it out for two years. And there's a specific reason why I say two years. Okay. You lived in it two years. You rented it for two years. Okay. Then you sell it. Okay. Capital gains free. Because it's four years? Or? Because you lived in it two of the last five years. Oh, okay. Okay. There's an exemption if you lived in the house two of the last five years. Okay. So you lived in it for two. During that transition year, you're moving into the new house, yep. and then you rent it. You need to sell it before that five-year period because you need to be able to declare two, two of the last five years. Right, 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 right. But when you sell it, the capital appreciation, cap gains exempt. 
not no cap gains. There is cap gains, but it's exempt from capital gains tax. So, uh, so, uh, so let's say you were to sell this place, okay? Uh -huh. You could rent this for two years. I mean, this place is worth a lot more than you paid for. It. Yes. A lot more. Yeah. Right? Yes. You could rent it for two, two years. Almost double. Let the market build up, okay, even more. Right now we're moving in Columbus, Ohio, we're moving about 11% right now. Now, I think that's going to moderate. <clears throat> yep. But let's say this area is always going to uh, increase at 7 to 8%. You go build something new, okay? While it's getting built new, you make sure you get this to max, max value, which you're close now, mm -hmm. okay? But you could rent this for two years on top of it. Right get the appreciation that comes from that. Yeah. And when you go to sell it, it has, it, well, again, let me clarify this. Talk to your CPA. <laughs> because if you're making above a certain amount, you're not exempt. But when you sell the house, it has that exemption possibility. Now, again, talk to your CPA. I'm not one. That's my standard disclaimer. I'm not a CPA, <laughs> right? I'm just a real estate dude. And I understand this better than some accountants do. But, um, but the bottom line, people can live in their own house. You know, everybody thinks about house hacking, which has become a popular term. They're like, oh, I got to go buy a double so I can house hack. Or I got to go right. buy a, I get, I get this because, yeah. so I can house hack. No, no. You can house hack any property. Right. If someone's willing to rent. Right. You know, if you have a house right next door to the nuclear power plant that just had a meltdown. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll concede that. Chernobyl. Yeah, I'll concede that's not going to work, right? But you got bigger problems. <laughs> but in the end, if that property can be rented to cover your expenses, cover your mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good strategy. Plus, everybody's like, well, if I sell now, what am I going to buy? Right. That's Yeah, you hear that a lot right now. Well, what you buy is... You go make your own buy. You build. Yeah, I'm a fan of building. You go and build, and you don't put all the fancy, crazy, nutty stuff in it. You're going to do that after, after the fact. Yeah. Okay? You're still going to be competing with the neighborhood. Right. But you're going to do it cheaper than right. your neighbors did. Right. You know, you get all the value of the appreciation. Right? Yeah. And in addition to that, you have the, the force or the the clear vision glasses to see what everybody else did. So if you had plans of flipping this property, but everybody else built at the lowest level, you're not going to flip it very well. Right. Because there's no room to move up in that category. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you can buy a property, let's just use round numbers. You can buy a property at $400,000 and the average property that got built in the neighborhood was six fifty. dollars you got a lot of room there yeah. to improve that property. That's kind of like what I did here. Yeah? Yeah. That's, we got this house for three something. Well, the average house was probably five, four fifty ish. Four fifty at the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's a lot more. <laughs> I remember the builder was because we priced this house. <laughs> we priced this house. We house hacked this. <laughs> yeah, you house hacked this one good. We actually priced this house with all of the bells and whistles and yeah you know a lot of people don't realize this you used to live literally next door yeah literally. right yeah so you didn't have to build this right but you wanted something smaller then you finished the basement and made it bigger, bigger. Than the <laughs> next door. but um in the process of, of doing this and it's so funny um you had this house pr priced out with all the bells and whistles and everything in it. Then, when they wouldn't negotiate with you, you were like, oh, okay. Then one day, you pick up the phone, you call me, and I'm like, and, and he's like, wait a minute. I fix up houses as part of my living. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if we build the minimum yeah, house? Yeah, let's just get all the space. Now, the part of that that you probably don't know the sales manager from the company called me and ripped me to shreds. <laughs> it was a tight over time period too because they, yeah. they weren't selling real good in here. 
I mean, they were not happy with me. <laughs> they wanted me to advocate for you to come back and try to do this bigger bill. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I represent my client. Right. And this makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. You yeah. know? It worked out. And it ended up, oh, goodness. Yeah. I mean, you could sell this house at least twice what you spent yeah. for it. Yeah. So it's, it, I think that bottom line is it pays to have uh, a If you good. included a few of the cars, you could really get <laughs> double. <laughs> for those on my channel that don't know who Will is, go over to his channel and check out. Not only does he talk about entrepreneurship, real estate, all those things, but check out the cars that he has. Got a little toys here and there. It's impressive. Maybe we'll get some B-roll and insert here sure. in the video. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah. I wouldn't have the cars if I didn't have the real estate investment. Yeah. So I wasn't even thinking about the toys and the cars and stuff. But you even treat the cars, though, like you treat real estate. Because it's possible. Yeah, that's that's the you other thing get I realized. Attached. No, 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 no. You know, no, 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 no. Because you, because I, I feel like everything is temporary anyway. So you're just like the steward for it for a moment, moment. So enjoy it while you can, but always be prepared for a material thing to go. I mean, I know you love your Huracan, but if someone came in and yeah. offered you enough money yeah. for it, yeah. <laughs> it's a car. <laughs> it's a car. I like it. You know, it was somewhat sentimental, but it's still a car. Yeah. But, but. I like to say the truth of the matter is if it hadn't been that, you know, starting that investment journey in 2011 and buying it, like I basically took all of my extra money that I could afford to do. It was like pay taxes, buy houses, pay taxes and pay my staff and all that good stuff too, but buy houses um, and pay taxes. And then we got to the point where it was like, wow, market started to come up a little bit. Let me sell a couple of these houses. Wow, you know, I'm do I got some investments now, you know, because I didn't have real estate market. My business was my investment, my my main full time job. That's where almost business. all your eggs were, right? Pretty much, yeah. That's yeah. that was the gamble, and it you know started doing well. Like, but then I started investing. Then I said, okay, wow, I finally got some investments. Now I can, and I didn't need the money that was coming in from the rental income. I could reinvest it in the houses and pay down the debt. Then I said, let me get myself a toy because you only live once. <laughs> <laughs> so, so moving forward, so the joke is that, okay, the best time to buy real estate was 2011. The next best time is tomorrow, okay? The, the strategies today versus the strategies that Will employed in 2011 are different, but yet they're similar. So... What all these big companies are doing, they're coming in and paying retail. I got a question for you, too. As long as they're making debt service, okay, they're banking over the long term that that property is going to go up in value and they're going to leverage out that value and they're going to build out over the long term and create the cash flow in the meantime. So here's my question for you. Yeah. As a real estate agent in one of the hottest markets in the country, have you started to get investors? that want to work with you to help them find and buy an Airbnb in Columbus? Airbnb, this is another unique item out of COVID. So let me give you my take on Airbnb. Sure. Number one, if you want a job, go Airbnb. Airbnb is not a passive real estate investment. Mm -hmm. It is a job. You're, you're going to be working at it. You have to get those top ratings. You have to s separate yourself they can go to a hotel, they can go to, you know, all kinds of different places, or they can stay in your Airbnb. So it is a job that you're buying. Next, once you've decided you do want to do that, then either be the best or don't do it. So where you made the objective choice to be the best in class for your real estate properties, yep. there's... There's no compromise on, on the Airbnb. Airbnb. You're going to get rated every time. <laughs> you're going to get rated every time, yeah. and you're going to be rated based on what you did yesterday, mm -hmm. not what you've done over 10 years. Okay, yeah. Okay? Yeah. So you've held properties for 10 years, and you're rated based upon those 10 years on your company of rental properties. Mm -hmm. Airbnb, you're rated on what you did yesterday. Right. You know? Yeah. So... It is a service business. 
that happens to have an asset attached to it. Mm -hmm. Now the asset's going to appreciate, the asset's going to be cool and all that kind of stuff, but the Airbnb function is a business that is a service right. business. Now have you had demand for it though from... Well, this is the killer part. <laughs> when the when COVID struck and of course all the Airbnb cancellations took place and you know there was no travel taking place, no nothing. I went to my Airbnb owners and I said, there's going to be a massive need that you can uniquely fill. Mm -hmm. I went to all of them and I said, set up a way. I don't care how you do it. Figure out a way to be able to talk to these people in advance of them checking in because they're coming in and going to quarantine. Figure out what they need in the fridge. Figure out what they need to be able to stay for two weeks. Okay. And not have to leave your place. And then stock the refrigerator. Right. Have that place ready to right. go. Yeah. Now that was a service. The people I told that to and the ones that listened to it were booked up solid nice. in the first parts of COVID. Nice. They, they didn't have to sell. I know a lot of Airbnb operators that when all those cancellations came in, mortgage was still due, taxes right. are still due, right. everything's still due. They had to sell. So my strategy, and this applies not only to Airbnb, but, but to just my real estate investment strategy in general, is I, the, the real estate income profit or whatever revenue that came in from renting out the properties was a plus for me. My strategy was always to have a backup income stream that could cover for a tenant that leaves or a tenant that tears up my property that I've got to repair or anything that might happen to my real estate portfolio so that I can weather a long-term storm. So my strategy was pretty conservative. So basically what I'm saying is I had, I made sure I had the income coming in or the money set aside to not go broke or not to have a super a problem where I got to go get a, a loan to weather a storm uh, as I was growing my portfolio. Now, not everybody has that luxury, but you should have some type of backup strategy, whether that's putting up a big enough down payment to lower your monthly payment and to have some equity to tap into if you need to or what or being smart, essentially. Right. So so that when that kind of situation happens with the Airbnbs, and they don't have the income to cover the expenses, then they got to sell. So the, the people that got themselves in trouble, and the, it was the same during the, the big crash in 2009. Mm -hmm. The people that over leveraged themselves, mm -hmm. that basically sucked out every dime out of it and then were maximizing rent, that's how they were financing. Those are the people that ran into trouble. Now, with that being said, appreciation rates have taken place in such a way that we're not seeing those properties right. dragging down the People values. forget about the appreciation. Even I'm guilty of forgetting about the big picture, which was the biggest thing that has happened for me besides I get monthly income. I have 20 live uh, investment properties right now. And as you can imagine, the rent is on average, it's over $1,000 a month. So I'm getting some good revenue, but I got expenses, right? I got to pay all kinds of expenses, and I might have a few thousand dollars left over at the end of the month or, or more or less or whatever. But the big thing for me has been the um, appreciation and my net worth. Yeah, those two ends of that though. You're paying out all those expenses, but it's also paying down your debt. Yeah, my debt is getting paid down at the same time. Which you've been really smart. You were doing what, 10 year notes? I had a variety, I've got everything. You've got everything yeah, built yeah. in there, but anyway, you were paying down debt. You weren't as necessarily focused on income right. as you were on having the asset, et cetera. But the part that you always lose track of, I mean, I don't, I don't want to put out anything that's out of school, but from 2011 until today, if you knew what the appreciation rates were on the, <laughs> on the properties yeah, that you hold, yeah, yeah. you'd be like, wait a minute, yeah, I'm worth to... what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my, 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 like, uh, and, but that was one of the things when 
My favorite book that I tell people is The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Favorite book of my life. Listen to it on audio probably 20 times plus. Just wait until I write my book. You'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be your favorite it, book then. It's definitely my favorite oracle, right? <laughs> Rich is the oracle of, re, uh, of real estate and the oracle of meaning database. So, But um, one of the big things in that book was use real estate, invest in real estate, but then watch what happens to your net worth. And it's true. Like I got into real estate. If I hadn't have gotten into real estate and I just put money in the bank, I would have probably my net worth would probably be a third of what it is right now. Yeah. Something like that. So, well, and the cool part of this is just a basic of real estate. You can go out and pay cash, which that's the way you started was paying cash for real estate. But as soon as you put that loan on it, as long as the appreciation rate exceeds what the interest rates are, you get what's <clears throat> called a leverage return. So let's use simple numbers. You purchase a $100,000 property, you put down 20,000 on it, right? 80,000 mortgage. $80,000 in mortgage. Now, the property goes up. Let's use an even number, five grand, mm -hmm. okay? 5%. Don't forget, the $100,000 property is what goes up. Right, not the 80,000 that you owe on or the 20,000 that, that you right. put down. Right. But let's look at what your cash on cash percentage is. Mm -hmm. If the property goes right. up 5%, right. which you put down 20, which yeah, since 2013, yeah. teach them rich. You guys listen to okay. this. Okay. Since 2013, 5% was the low end of the market. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 5% on a hundred thousand, that's $5,000. 5,000, but what is 5,000 to 20% that you put you down? You put down, you only have 20,000 in cash in it. So what is 5,000 5, to 20? That's, okay. uh, what percentage That's 25%. That? Can, you, can you tell me one other investment than except for your technology company? <laughs> okay. Right. That's and what he means by cash on cash. Uh, cash return. on cash return. Is what is your ca return on your cash you put up, not the value of the... Cash investment. on cash return is 25%. Yeah, that's crazy. Even though the property only appreciated 5%. Right. Cash on know? cash. Yep. And you have an asset that is never going to be worth zero. Right. Unless you're sitting next door to Chernobyl. Okay. <laughs> but even the crappiest of house right. is going to be worth something. Right. And you, you, know? can, you can do something with it, too. You can fix it up. You can do all kinds of stuff. Right. The key, and, and if no one takes anything else away from our eating ribs and looking like we've been <laughs> hit with uh, barbecue sauce, if, if you take no, nothing else away from it, have be in a position where you don't have to do anything. Right. You know, people talk all the time. Les Wexner, who owns The Limited, lives here in Columbus. Jeff Bezos lost billions of dollars this week in the stock market. One catch. They didn't sell their stock. Right. Next week, that same stock went up. Right? People who own real estate, it's the same premise. If you don't have to sell the real estate, don't worry about the market. A good deal is a good deal, period, the end. I don't care if the market's the hottest in the world or it's the crappiest in the world. A good deal is a good deal. I mean, I, I know for a fact that if I brought Will a deal and I said, here's a good deal, and he ran the numbers on it, he'd buy it. Yeah. And now, it's harder to find a good deal in a good market, which right. means you have to work, work harder. Yeah, you got a little competition and stuff. You know, but <clears throat> if I were to tell the average person out there, if you were to set up a side hustle and you worked two hours a night on your side hustle and you could make ten thousand dollars a month working two hours a night would you do it <laughs> okay i don't know anybody watching this that wouldn't say yes or at least i'm gonna smack them around if they would <laughs> right. okay that's the numbers we're talking about yeah, yeah. you know it's hard work well, guess what? That's just, yeah. yeah. Everything's hard yeah. work. It's not all, everything, yeah. Have, it, 
you're in the technology business. Yep. Right? Yep. Was it hard work? Yeah, a lot of hard work. I, I don't know anybody. Probably the hardest thing you ever did, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know too many people that work like I work. Yeah. Uh, was that harder or was real estate harder? Uh, it's a different kind of hard. It's but different, um, but real estate is not harder than what I had to do now. Yeah. Yeah, I would say real estate is easier. Um, <laughs> but I have the advantage of everything I learned running the, the technology company. But, you know, when a lot of times when people, a lot of times people say hard work, it's not that it's hard or difficult. It's just that you've got to get it done. You, you're responsible. It may take some time and you're going to have to be focused in that, in that time period and you're going to have to grind it out and get it done. But it might not even be that hard. Like for me, like writing software and that kind of thing is fun. It's like doing a game or a puzzle and it's not that hard for me, but I have had some times where it's been hard. But the grind that I have to put in, the amount of work I had to put in, the hours I had to put in, it's long, a lot. Compared to real estate, time-wise, yeah. it's a lot easier with real estate yeah. time-wise, yeah. right? Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. This is something else that Will talk And that's about. why I focus a lot on, on my channel on real estate. Yeah, so this is another uh, thing that, that Will taught me. So I remember one Thanksgiving weekend, he didn't have his kids that, that particular Thanksgiving. I come over after Thanksgiving and he has the most beautiful piece of software written to manage <laughs> properties that you've ever seen. Functionality wise, it wasn't pretty, but it, but it was functionality wise, it was incredible. And I was like, so where'd that come from? He's like, oh, I wrote it this weekend. And my mind is blown, right? But that's what I do, like that's my... Right, now he wrote it over the weekend. But then what he told me beyond that mm -hmm. was more important. Yeah. He wrote it in one weekend because for months he yeah, had been, been thinking about, thinking about, it. about yeah. it, putting everything in order. Yeah, that's, that's kind of like the hard part. So let's tie it to real estate. Remember that tools on the tool belt thing? Now, a lot of people over-educate. They're like, I'm going to read everything. I'm yeah. going to read everything yeah. and never do a deal, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, that doesn't work. Right. But the other thing that doesn't work is not thinking forward about your real estate investment journey. Right. Where do I want to get to? Right. The, the premise of a, a real estate for income versus a real estate for long-term wealth, two different paths. Everybody wants both, but you have to prioritize one. Mm -hmm. You know, so as you go, just be aware that, that that's what. Uh, Do you want to take any questions from live? Sure. All right. Sure. So we got Rich the Realtor here. Um, and if you guys have any questions on the live stream, go ahead and drop the questions and, and we'll ask Rich. I'm happy to chime in as well. But I want to thank everybody for joining us and for Rich's audience. I want to thank you guys for for watching this video as well, make sure you hit that subscribe button because Rich is uh, a wealth of knowledge. Believe me on that. All right, so we got any questions. Can Rich drive the Lambo? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll be first in line. Yeah, yeah he can, we can definitely do a video of that. Do we own apartment units? Uh, I own some condos that look like apartments, but they're condos. I don't own apartment Units I mean, yet. The, they want to know your channel too. Yeah, it's Rich Shiro. That last name is spelled S H E A R R O W. Uh, first name Rich. Uh, we're building up our content. My my assistant Sarah over here is working hard on getting things ended. We had up a mukbang today. Yeah, putting it all together. The ribs beat us this time. <laughs> but um, apartments is a different game than under four units. So four units and under is one uh, end of the real estate market. Five units and above, all the way up to the big, huge apartment complexes, that's a different uh, ball game. And uh, yes, you could make money on either one, but- Can I tell you what I learned? Yeah. Early on, I didn't mean to interrupt, no. but it goes, ties right into what you're saying. It's a different ball game. What I learned is that when I reached out to you, I had already talked to a couple of these apartments that were getting built around here. Yeah. 
the return on invest well it's a little bit more turnkey the return on investment the roi raw roi for an apartment unit was like i want to say it was like six or seven percent right so your return on your money was like six or seven percent the return i was getting or could get with the properties that rich and i started looking at as single family homes as opposed to an apartment unit was much much higher than the seven percent that they were talking about for the apartment the other thing was having a single family home i had more flexibility in who could buy it because there's only certain people that will buy an apartment unit usually investors and they want to buy a bunch of them whereas with a single family home you can get everybody investors homeowners well just to put it into perspective big apartment buildings the cap rates now which is what you're talking about that's the technical term the cap rates now are being crushed to about two to three percent now great long-term investments okay mm -hmm. or great if you can do a value add mm -hmm. but turnkey out of the door apartment buildings cap rates are getting crushed down to about two to three percent got a good question here yeah this is a good uh, this is an interesting question somebody asked if you had uh, Wayne Freeman said, if you had 300,000 to begin real estate investing, would you focus on buying one property for cash or do you take control of multiple properties through leverage? I started out with 300K. That was well, my, that was my starting point. Well, let me give you your first stage. And this is what, not to brag on myself, but I will. Will started out calling real estate agents and finding a good one. Okay. <laughs> Depends on, people hate it when I give them the answer, it depends. Mm -hmm. But it honestly does. If your goal is to create income with that 300,000, or your goal is to just not lose money and take 300,000, it's two totally different things. So, let me tell you a story, and it's, it, it's a fable, but it's a story that we'll oh, be, that, that we'll be able to, to relate to. So I could go out and find a piece of real estate that was the, the absolute best deal that ever existed and put a crappy carpenter in it, put a crappy property manager in it, have a bad realtor and have a bad lender, right? What happens to the best real estate deal in the world? Turns into the worst. Turns into the worst, right? Now, if I take an average real estate deal and I bring in a great team on that deal, great realtor, great lender, great, uh, great fix-up crew, great property manager, they'll make that average deal into a great deal. So the first thing I would do with that $300,000 is... I would start assembling a good team. Like Will said, he started with $300,000 was, he bought four properties for $300,000 in one weekend. Which, yeah, I spent all my cash pretty much. Yeah, but I was able to show him then how to take those properties, get financing on them, and build an even bigger portfolio yeah. from that. Leverage. Yeah. That'd so, be my answer. So the answer is, it depends on what your goals are. I mean, if you're just starting out and you're, you know, 28 years old and, and that kind of thing, my answer is going to be different than if you're getting ready to retire next year. The answer is going to be different depending on the person. So but, I know that doesn't answer the question, but. And, I, and I'll give you my perspective. Like, so if I had 300,000, so like if you ask me, and it's a buyer's market, which is when I started, I would consider a buyer's market. I, um, I would keep some of that money. I wouldn't spend all of it, but I would keep some of it to do your rehabs and to do them well, right? Keep some of that money and to weather any storms on your strategy, whether it's flip or buy and hold. And then I would leverage the rest of it as 20% down payments to get as many properties as I could, because if you're in a buyer's market, my thing is, if you can buy a property and control it, then you can be the one to make the profit off of it either way, by buying it and holding it as a rental property or by flipping it. So, um, but, if you, but if you take that money and you buy it all, use it all in, in cash, you'll be able to, and you buy properties in cash, 
then you'll be able to get control over less property. So like if I look back in time to when we started and I had, there were so many opportunities, if I could go back in time, I would have tried to buy, <laughs> I would have tried to buy everything I could. Yeah. I mean, um, hind hindsight's always 20, right, 20, but right, right. A, just remember this statement, a good deal is a good deal, whether it's in the hottest real estate market or the crappiest real estate market. Let me see what other questions we got. <laughs> Rich question for you. How many homes on average to gain 1 million in net worth from Roderick Hayes? <laughs> okay, <laughs> on so, average, what's the average? So net worth of 1 million. Depends on where you live. Uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, average real estate uh, property you're probably going to buy is going to be two hundred and fifty to $300,000. That's what I say, yeah. Now, you purchase that, do them up on a 20-year amortization, uh, you could build a million dollar net worth with four properties. Assuming no growth, no appreciation, okay? Um, million dollar net worth flipping homes, a lot. Right now, to flip homes, people are getting lucky to make 20 grand in, in flipping a home. So, uh, so I'm proud of myself. <laughs> so, so if you're making 20 grand per property flipping a home, you, you know, you're, you're hitting the ball out of the ballpark. So, um, so long and the short, million dollar net worth, it's gonna be your time in the market and what your strategy is to get there. So question from um, Bartos Obedzinski. Says, so 2021 is a market for who, buyer or seller? <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is my favorite question of, <laughs> of all time. This is, the, this is the question I get asked when I'm standing in line at the grocery store and people find out I'm a realtor. Um, literally, it depends on the street that you're talking to me about. <clears throat> so here in Columbus, um, the neighborhoods are as diverse as the people who live in them. And we have a very diverse community. Um, Literally, I could take the community we're in right now, compare it to the community right next door, which is a, it's a golf course community, really nice, really, really nice homes. And then Will's community, really nice community, but more of a, a park-like setting type thing. Mm -hmm. These two communities couldn't be any, any more different from each other. And they're literally side by side. Yeah. If I were to go one mile south of here, I could show you a place where the property values are going down. <laughs> one mile south. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One mile south. So <clears throat> buyer's market, seller's market is a relative term. It's a set, During the Great Recession, the area that I lived in lucked out. I would love to say it was my talent. <laughs> But the area that I lived in actually went up in value during the recession. And it never dropped. We slowed down mm -hmm, right. in our growth, mm -hmm. but it never dropped. I'd love to say that was skill, that was pure luck on my part. But um, so, and, but in that same area, it's a school district in general uh, that, that you're talking about. Within that school district, there were areas that went up and areas that went down. So Rich is, Rich is, <laughs> so I'm you sound like a politician. <laughs> so, so literally. Most people would say it's a seller's market, right? Well, right now, nationwide, most people would say, oh, it's a seller's market. Right. Because there's more people wanting houses. Right. And inventory's low. Yeah. And, so in Columbus, uh, as the whole Columbus market, we could drop 70,000 homes from the sky tomorrow, drop them on pieces of land, right. and we would be even. Right, okay, 70 additional houses. So we're 70,000 homes short right now. 70,000. 70,000 in a community that's 2.1 million people. So, but what makes a seller's market versus a buyer, buyer's market, in, in my opinion, because I'm not an expert like Rich is, but, you got low interest rates, you've got low inventory, which is increases the demand, right? Low inventory, low interest rates, high prices for homes. 
And so me being a homeowner and an investor, it feels like a seller's market and most in general, like columnists and people that's uh, talking heads and people that talk about stuff, right. they say it's a seller's market. However, to Rich's point, Rich is being uh, accurate to say it's all relative. It's all relative because you can't just buy any property and expect it to be to fit all to fit the mold of the demand or lack of demand. Right. Right. So uh, but they would say in general, 2021 is a seller's market. So if you own a home, you could do flips and stuff like that. However, so let's give let's give some some general stats. So generally speaking, when you have a six months worth of inventory on the market, that's considered a balanced market. So if you took all the homes sold for the last six months, added them all up, if, if there was that number of homes on the market, it's a balanced buyer seller's market. Now, in the middle of this summer in Columbus, Ohio, at one point we were down to eight days worth of inventory. Eight days versus six months. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Is it a, now, is real estate a good thing to get into right now? <laughs> now, inventory is up right now. So we're up to about 16 days. So in other words, inventory doubled on the market. And we're at 16 days. <laughs> I mean, it's basically it's crazy right now. Yeah, but if you, if you listen to the talking heads, inventory has doubled on the market, right? Mm -hmm. Well, inventory needs to about... 17 fold on the market before yeah. we we'll get balanced there you go so um so in general by it's a seller's market for sure there are places where there are buyers market to be had and um uh, so but yes it is a very tight market for sure i saw another good question in here um uh let's see here Okay, so this question is from Lil Soldier. Uh, Lil Soldier, <laughs> Will Rich might be an obvious answer. Do you find it easy to decide between a flip and a long-term hold from Sean Smith? So I'll give my short answer and then Rich can give his probably more detailed answer because he's seen way more than I have. But is it obvious to determine between a um, buy and hold versus a flip? To me, I look at the market. So like right now in this kind of a market, I feel like the obvious thing for me to do in this market would be to flip because if I buy and hold, because of the prices relative to when I started investing in real estate and what I've seen for this market are higher. So my mortgage would be higher, I'd have to charge more for rent and my profit margin would probably be smaller if I buy and hold. However, if I do a flip, then my profit margin has a potential of being higher based on the prices that homes are selling for. So for me to get a good deal, like Rich says, you got a, a good deal is a good deal is a good deal. If I got a good deal in this kind of market, I feel like I could turn it over quickly, uh, irregardless of how much profit I make, I probably could sell it quickly if I price it right. So for me, that feels like, based on my criteria, it would be a flip market. But if the market, all of a sudden, interest rates start to go up, banks started getting tight on loaning money for mortgages and the demand for houses dropped and then the supply went way up and a bunch of houses are for sale, then I'll be like, okay, now the shark comes. Here comes a shark, I'm gonna buy some and I'm gonna hold them and I'm gonna make money off of uh, uh, renting. So that's the way I look at it. So generally speaking, it doesn't work this way all the time, but generally speaking, a good flip will be a good rent and hold a good rent and hold will not necessarily be a good flip. Um, the numbers just work out that way most of the time. So if, if you take a, uh, a property that there's enough profit margin in for you to make a flip on, generally speaking, it's going to cash flow, right? Now, here's the answer that I want to see you really need to be in a position to at least break even on a flip, even on a buy and hold. Yes, that's 100%. Because, heaven forbid something happens, right, we need to go out and you know uh, 
you lose your job. You any number of things happen. I agree, hundred percent. You want to at least be able to break even right. on the flip, right? Even if you're buying it long term hold, right? Then as time builds, you're going to build up that equity. Yeah. Okay. Conversely, on a flip, unless you're a really seasoned real estate investor, my advice is always first. Uh, first thing that you're going to do with this strategy is to flip it, but there's a backup plan. The backup plan is you're going to be able to rent it. For what it's worth, this also applies to first-time homebuyers. I always advise my first-time homebuyers, even if they make huge money, and even if they have all the pieces of the puzzle to go out and build the mega mansion, okay? The first property that you buy, you're going to get it wrong. Think about the first home that you bought, Will. It took a long time then. But would you even remotely consider it the, the, the kind of house you would need today? For my where I live? Yeah, not even close, right? Not because you made a bad decision, it's just your life was different then. Right. You know? So uh, the first property you build, your life is going to change just because you bought a house. Your life is going to change as you have kids, as you change jobs, as you do this, as you do that. So that first property, you want to be in a position to rent it if you need to. Mm -hmm. You're in the tech industry making big money and you're working in Silicon Valley and you paid out the, the nose for a property in Silicon Valley and you can't rent it? What happens if the market takes a nosedive out there and you're down a million bucks? which is very possible, okay? Conversely, Columbus, Ohio, you purchase a home that's, you know, $800,000 here, market takes a nosedive, you get transferred to Silicon Valley and you can't rent it to cover your expenses, you have to sell. That's the position you do not want to be in. Exactly, because then you might have to take an L. But if you can rent it, cover your expenses, you're primo. So the question is, Next question is from Mike Johnson. Uh, can we speak to the difference of value in getting into a new build home as opposed to an established property? So I'm an advocate of new builds, but Rich probably has way more experience seeing people buy both. But my perspective it has been when you buy, like one thing I noticed right out the gate is when you buy a new build home versus an existing home, if they have the same specs, they're the, they're the same price. So my thing is, it's almost like buying cars, right? Which I had been used to. Why buy a used car with some potential problems when you can buy a brand new car for the same price if they have the same specs? Now, I know if you buy an existing home, you know more usually about the neighborhood, right? You got the neighborhood, you may have more of a mature landscape around that neighborhood and that kind of thing. But with the new build, my thought, reason why I lean towards buying a new build is the price point is usually the same as an existing house, but you get warranty on your appliances and all kinds of stuff like that. Now that's from a home owner that's living in a property as an investor, as an investor, I don't care if it's new or used a deal is a deal. Cause I'm going to make it new, like new. My intention would be to make it like new anyway, or better than whatever state I bought it in. So um, that's my two cents on that one. So my, my take on it is, A, what's your goal? If your goal is to have a passive real estate investment that, that you don't have to put a lot of work into, building to rent now is possible. Okay, it's possible to build a property and rent it in cash flow. Um, if you, on the other hand, uh, have all the connections and the team to be able to renovate. Now you build a property that is uh, not at the top of the neighborhood that you're going to add things to, to make it, you know, upper end of the neighborhood. And you can do it for less money than the builder is going to charge you. Little secret for, for people that are out there, N not every builder is this way, but a lot of builders are this way. They'll make that much money on the house and they'll make this much money on the upgrades. <laughs> okay. 
So you can get those up, same upgrades done. Prime example is my house. I just built one. I was quoted $23,000 for the particular type of flooring that I wanted to put in the house. It's, it's a decent sized house and it's expensive flooring. I was quoted $23,000 to put it in. The exact same company that would have put it in for the, uh, for the builder, I happen to have a deal with for my investors. So I had a quote done for quite frankly, better flooring than what I was getting quoted from the builder, from the builder. Mm -hmm. better flooring and uh, had it quoted out and lock, stock and barrel, including everything, I was in for less than $9,000. So I built an immediate, uh, you know, almost $12,000 equity in my house with a better product right. after I closed than I would have if I would have done it through the builder. Now, that's unique. But granite countertops, um, uh, flooring, flooring, especially flooring, mm -hmm. um, finishing a basement. Uh, trim sometimes. Yeah, to trim work occasionally, but but the, the especially light fixtures. Oh my goodness, light fixtures. Um, the prices you can get those things for many times are a half or a third of what you're going to pay through the builder. Existing versus building. If you are in a neighborhood that is showing moderate appreciation and you can buy a property that needs fix up, right. that's going to be your better deal. But here's the catch. You're going to be working for six months to find that property when quite frankly, you could have went into contract on the build gotten six months of appreciation from the build price mm -hmm. and had an investment rolling. It, it, it's what investors call opportunity cost. You can look for six months for, for the perfect property to fix up, but you can build new and be in the game. You might make less money, but because you're in the game, you actually end up ahead. You know, would you rather make, you know, uh, would you re would you rather make a hundred dollars in six months, or make uh, twenty dollars per month for six months? Mm -hmm. The little little game for what it's worth. There's a uh, there's a math game where people say I will pay you ten thousand dollars a month, or I will pay you one penny the first day, two pennies the second day, four pennies the third day, and so on. <laughs> Which way do you want to get paid? The person who asks for $10,000 literally leaves millions on the table. So when you can build on top of each other, okay, build those pennies, that's better than taking the big payday down the road. There you go. Uh, I love these comments. Yeah, so you guys know on my channel, um, I like to have fun with the cards and stuff like that, but this is what it's really about. It's about sharing knowledge with no holds barred. Uh, next question I see is... We're going to have to wrap up <laughs> questions, though, because oh, okay, we cool. are up on time, but I don't... we can take one more. One more question. All right, one more question. Um, this is a good one. Nate Car Review says... He's 21 years old. He'd like to have a large multifamily real estate portfolio one day. What do you believe should be his first job to become familiar in real estate to start getting into real estate? I have a, I have a perspective on that. Mine's pretty quick and easy. I think your first job shouldn't be necessarily to learn real estate, like to get a job to learn real estate. My thought is that you should try to get a job Will you'll learn something that will help you make maximize whatever skills and aptitude you have to maximize how much money you have because picking up real estate, um, you can either do it yourself like like I did. I just bought some books and you know interviews. And it's, and it's not a poor man's game, is it? <laughs> no, no. So it, it, it's better to have money because you can make more money the more money you have versus borrowing money, right? But um, so that would be my first thing. But then you can pick up real estate 
through your own studies and your own research. But then you could also like, I know a lot of people that have become realtors or real estate agents through going through the courses and taking the test and becoming a licensed real estate agent. Where at the minimum, I know a lot of people who, who did it that don't actually practice yeah. selling, but yeah, they're I trying would, to learn. I would stop short of getting a license because the minute you get the license, oh, you gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you've got rules. all kinds of, but just getting the education, right? So go through the classes, right? Just don't take the test and get the license, right? So you can learn, you can learn that, but my advice is look at yourself, look in the mirror, see what skills you have, see what aptitude you have and figure out what type of career path you can follow that will make the most money based on your skills and then learn real estate investing, learn entrepreneurship, learn different things that can get you to that next level to where you can build a large multi-family real estate portfolio if that's what you want. So my answer would be learn business first. Whether you're in the tech field, whether you're in a side hustle, whether you're in real estate, whether you're in whatever you're doing, learn business first. There's certain business principles that will apply across the board no matter what business you're in. So if you want to build a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio, you have to understand business before you understand real estate. Because if you treat real estate as a hobby, you'll get hobby results. Okay? <laughs> so, so Will's... <laughs> Will's advantage coming into it was he treated his real estate investments as a business. Yeah, as a business. <laughs> he, un he understood branding. Thus, he made his properties nicer than other properties mm -hmm. to brand them better. He understood cash flow. So, therefore, he understood that he was going to have certain expenses he was going to have to cover when there was no income coming in. So, that kind of business end of it is probably the most important education. The and if you're looking for a job, learn a job where you're going to learn those skills. Uh, secondly, more and more, man, real estate is going tech. Don't neglect your tech skills. And if you can get in, my first job that, that got into tech, um, I was in human resources. But everything went online when I was in human resources. I learned more about tech because I had to. Mm -hmm. So real estate's the same way. More and more, the mundane tasks can be handled through tech. When I talk about Will's software, the, the beauty of his software is the mundane tasks get taken care of and he doesn't have to spend time on it. Yeah, that's an old point, yeah. So, um, but d don't neglect that. The job that you get to build a real estate portfolio, go work with other real estate people. You know, uh, Sarah, my assistant. Uh, what do you mean by that? When you said, well, I was, I was going to use Sarah as my as my example. Sarah worked for different people in the real estate field uh, before she came to work for me, but no one took the time to teach her and train her. You know the. Well, I take that back. She worked for one person that gave her a good overview. But then COVID hit and she lost that job. So she came to work for me. And yes, I pay pretty decent. Okay. But I like to think that, <laughs> I like to think that working for me <laughs> is worth more because of the knowledge you get working for me. Yeah. Me too. The necessarily the pay that I pay. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Sarah's not going to work for me for free. <laughs> but, um, but for example, I sent her to real estate school. I paid for her to go to real estate school. If, if, um, you know, I was just looking to to uh, chew up. Uh, if I was just looking to chew up, you know, labor. I certainly wouldn't have paid to send her to real estate school. So, um, so to answer the question, the job you get, hang around real estate people, volunteer work, bring value. Don't just say, "Hey, can I be your your uh, mentor, mentee?" Yeah, can you mentor me? 
okay, what do you bring to the table? Can you edit video? Can you, um, uh, can you bring, um, can you bring customers to the table? Do you have a network of people? Do you have some skill that you can bring? Uh, if someone just calls me out of the blue and says, hey, would you mind teaching me about real estate? Uh, while I do teach real estate, I'll be happy to send you a bill to teach you real estate. <laughs> Bruh. Okay. Uh, I, Bruh. I do get paid for it, right? That's right. I mean, w Will would be a great mentor, but he put together a course. Right. If you really for real, there it is. You know, he put together a course because any good mentor doesn't have time to take on 12 mentees. And I got three businesses, so... There's no way Will could I, do it. Just, there's, there's no way I could do it. Yeah, and, and, and the course is good. Like, the course has in there everything I learned to, to build my portfolio. Yeah, but plus just, wait, just wait till I get mine done. Just to wait till I get mine done. So, but, you know, I, that's... Uh, if you're interested in my course, let's plug my course. Take my real estate course, willmotivation.com slash invest. There it is. There you go. But, but uh, also, go, 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 go subscribe to Rich's channel. Uh, Rich Shiro. S-H-E-A-R-R-O-W. I need to get a better name for it. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so all you guys on the live stream, we need to close out my, my video as well. So, hey, I hope everybody really enjoyed uh, uh, this video. I know we've been kind of all over the place, uh, back and forth, but um, uh, I really want to thank Will for spending the time. Of course, I brought him ribs. So. Yeah, thank you for the ribs. <laughs> Real estate investment, best, best strategies. Will's channel is willmotivation.com. If you want to see some cool content, it's awesome. And uh, that's where we'll wrap it up. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and uh, we'll catch you in the next video. Peace. Peace. Uh, Shiro is S-H-E-A-R-R-O-W, Rich Shiro. And uh, it's my realtor. This is, we've done lots of deals together. The Oracle of Information, as I like to call them. So if you're looking to do a deal in Central Ohio or if you're looking to learn, go subscribe to his channel. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Great questions. Great questions. Shiro, S-H-E-A-R-R-O-W. <laughs> Rich, first name Rich. That's it. I know. There it I, is. They got it. There I it know. Is. I got to get a better better name for my channel. I know. I know. That's good. That's good. I like it. Doesn't box you in. The Oracle. That actually is my name. The Oracle of Real Estate. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys. Um, I got a lot of cool stuff coming to the channel. You guys just stay tuned. Um, trying to share experiences, share a little bit of knowledge. Um, and maybe one day one of you guys will share some ribs. There you go. I like it though. Real estate investment, best strategies, ribs. <laughs> Rich came up with that. All right, y'all. Y'all enjoy your Sunday and um, watch a little football and plan out your week. But I'll see you guys in the next one.